So this is Dr. Renee Chosed from uh, Furman University. Uh, she got her uh, bachelor's degree in biochemistry and molecular biology, cum laude, in 2001 from uh, Trinity University. And then she got a PhD in biological sciences from University of Texas uh, Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, which is like a really good school, in case you didn't know, really good. Uh, then she did a postdoc at uh, the Anderson Cancer Center for a few years. Went back and taught at Trinity for uh, a year and then got her position at Furman. And for the last year, she was uh, an Embry Target faculty member. So she was one of the faculty uh, that was chosen to be able to do research and get paid for it from uh, the state of South Carolina's Embry program. And she's here to talk about stuff I don't understand about leukemia. <laughs> So, take it away. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, so the work I'm gonna talk about today was done by undergrads, just like yourself, um, at Furman, because like Coastal, we don't have grad students and master students in our lab, so it's all undergrads, and I'll show you their pictures at the end. So the talk I'm gonna give you today is about modeling the mixed lineage leukemia protein complex in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which are yeast, and it will make sense in a little bit why we're looking at leukemia in yeast, because yeast do not have leukemia. Um, so what I like to do for these talks is I like to start off with a few slides to get everyone on the same page. Everyone is probably familiar with the central dogma. Um, DNA is transcribed to RNA is translated to protein, which was proposed by Crick in 1958. But since then, there have been many updates to this dogma. So the updated central dogma um, would have things such as DNA, um, DNA methylation, histone modification, um, that there are regions in DNA that are not transcribed to RNA and protein. Um, also, that there is not unidirectional movement in this dogma, that RNA can be reverse transcribed back to DNA through the discovery of reverse transcriptase and retroviruses. Similarly, microRNAs can regulate gene expression at the mRNA level. And my um, interest lies in protein post-translational modification. So at the end of the central dogma, Proteins, there's another arrow. So proteins can be post-translationally modified by a variety of small proteins and small chemical molecules. And that's where my interest lies. So for, to keep, again, to keep us all on the same page, so a post-translational modification that most of you have probably heard of is phosphorylation. So protein X can be phosphorylated by an enzyme, and the enzyme that phosphorylates is a kinase, and kinases use ATP. Uh, Post-translational modifications in most cases are not static modifications. These modifications are reversible. They can be added and they can be removed. So phosphorylation is removed by a phosphatase. So these enzymes add post-translational modifications and these enzymes, so the kinase and phosphatase in this example, um, regulation is imposed on them as well. So what we'll get to in just a little bit is the types of regulation imposed on these enzymes. But I'll first briefly mention um, the role of these post-translational modifications. So these post-translational modifications that occur on proteins affect a variety of cellular processes. Um, so phosphorylation of serine, threonine, or tyrosine residues on a protein can affect multiple different pathways. So phosphorylation can affect signal transduction, different pathways in the cell, protein stability and protein folding, cellular localization of different protein different proteins, DNA binding, protein conformation, which can give rise to protein structural changes, receptor activation, gene expression, protein-protein interactions, anything you can imagine in the cell is often regulated by post-translational modifications. And phosphorylation is just one of these post-translational modifications. So the modification my lab is interested in is methylation. So methylation that we're going to be looking at generally occurs on lysine or arginine residues. <coughs> methylation is added via a methyl transferase enzyme and often can be removed by a demethylase enzyme. Um, and I like to stick this in because um, a lot of students remember this. So another post-translational modification many people are familiar with is ubiquitination. So polyubiquitination involved in degradation. So ubiquitination is another post-translational modification and it is caused by a series of enzymes add this modification and then a deubiquitating enzyme removes these modifications. So kind of have a nice background on what post-translational modifications are. 
So my overall research goal is to understand the <coughs> regulation of these post-translational modifications in human diseases. So how are the enzymes that are adding and removing these modifications involved in human diseases? Many of these are used as drug targets. And specifically today, I'm going to talk about understanding the regulation of the human MLL1 histone modifying complex using yeast. So before I get into the exact function of MLL and histones, I want to give a background on histones and chromatin so we're all on the same page. So you may have seen a slide like this before. Everyone's familiar with chromosome structure. So chromosomes are essentially um, made of chromatin protein and DNA, and the protein component of chromatin are histones. So histone proteins are the beads on a string image you may remember. So DNA is wrapped around these histones, and this is all packaged into chromosomes within our nucleus. So two meters of DNA are packaged into each cell. So what do histones have to do with post translational modifications? Well, histones, and I'm going to zoom in here, are subject to an array of post-translational modifications. So the histone octamer, as it referred to, is composed of two molecules of histone H3, two molecules of H4, two molecules of H2A, and two molecules of H2B. So this protein component histone is surrounded or wrapped with DNA, which is shown in black here. And what you should note for each histone molecule is each histone molecule has a, a tail to it. And these tail portions of the histones are actually the end terminus of the protein of each of these histone proteins. And the end termini or amino termini of each of these histone proteins is subject to a variety of post-translational modifications. And these <coughs> post-translational reg modifications regulate gene function or gene expression of the DNA wrapped around these histones. So I put in a bunch of shapes. Each of these shapes is representing a post-translational modification on the various histones. So I'm going to be talking a lot today about histone H3, which is shown in this figure right here. So it's a, one of, it's a molecule of the histone octamer that has one of these tails that is post-translationally modified. So for example, a post-translational modification on histone H3 on lysine 4, so the K here is representing the fourth lysine in that histone molecule, or a modification of lysine 14 of histone H3 are known to be associated with active or open chromatin. So active or open chromatin means that polymerase and transcription machinery has access to the genes and can transcribe these genes, which can sub subsequently be translated and made into protein, and can essentially the gene will now have function within the cell. Alternatively, other post-translational modifications on histones, maybe a post-translational modification on lysine 9 in histone H3, or a modification on serine 10 on histone H3, can lead to inactive or condensed chromatin. So condensed chromatin means that polymerase or transcription machinery doesn't have access to the promoters of certain genes, so these genes would not be transcribed or translated. So this is another function of post-translational modifications of regulating gene expression. And these types of post-translational modifications regulating gene expression is exactly where human diseases come in and where drug targets can be designed. So I showed before our lab is interested in methylation of histone H3. And methylation gets a little more complicated because methylation on lysine residues occurs at that epsilon amino group of the lysine side chain. And that amino group can be monomethylated, dimethylated, or trimethylated. So you can have up to three methyl groups on one lysine residue within your target protein. And our target protein is histone H3 in this case. The different methylations, or mono versus di versus tri, do have functional differences. So monomethylation we generally see on promoters, and it's thought to recruit other um, transcription machinery. And di and trimethylation are generally associated with active transcription or start sites of genes. So the enzyme that, or one of the enzymes that places this methylation post-translational modification on histones is the MLL1 methyltransferase. So that was what I showed on my beginning slide. So MLL1 stands for mixed lineage leukemia. 
So the MLL1 protein is a methyl transferase that adds these methyl groups to lysine residues on histones. So MLL, mixed lineage leukemia. So mixed lineage leukemia is an aggressive blood cancer. You've probably heard of AML or ALL type of um, leukemia. Mixed lineage leukemia has um, similarities from, or it's essentially a combination of both of those types of leukemia. So MLL fusion proteins are a result of chromosomal translocations. And I'm pretty sure it's chromosome 11 to chromosome 4. So what happens is the MLL gene located on a chromosome, part of it gets cut away and another fusion partner binds to that part of MLL. So MLL turns into a fusion protein which alters the function of that MLL methyl transferase. If you're altering the function of a methyl transferase, you could be affecting its ability to methylate its target protein. So MLL fusion proteins act as transcriptional regulators to the normal target genes of MLL. However, these normal target genes, okay, are going to be regulated in a different way. So one of the MLL's target genes are Hox genes, which you may have heard of. So Hox genes are essential in embryonic development um, and, and stem cell and blood cell development. So normally, which is shown on the upper slide over here, so normally Hox gene expression is lowered over time due to MLL regulation, and this leads to differentiated <coughs> cells. So cells going from stem cells to precursor cells to differentiated cells. However, when MLL is made as a fusion protein where it's not functioning properly or its normal way, it can lead to Hox gene expression not being lowered. And if Hox gene expression is not lowered, these stem cells consider continuously self-renew and turn into precancerous cells. And this leads to this leukemic phenotype. So MLL as a transcription factor can lead to this leukemic phenotype because it's not functioning properly as a transcription <coughs> regulator for these Hox genes. This is the most by, um, medical that we're going to get to today, so that's my medical slide. Um, so human MLL1, so this mixed lineage leukemia gene, is the homologue of a yeast gene. And the yeast gene that it looks like, okay, is called SET1. So human MLL1 and yeast SET1 both contain what we call a set domain. So that's their catalytic domain. That's the region of the protein that's responsible for this methyl transferase activity, or the ability to add methyl groups to histones. They both share the same substrate, histone H3, lysine 4 in this case. And both proteins require a complex of accessory proteins for full methyl transferase activity meaning the enzyme alone, the SET1 or MLL alone, cannot function properly. MLL and SET1 each require many other proteins to help them function. So I'm talking about leukemia and I'm talking about yeast. So why are we looking at yeast? Well, there's a couple reasons. One reason is that yeast are pretty simple eukaryotic organisms. So they're eukaryotic, which makes them very useful. They're single cell. Um, they're haploid or diploid, we pretty much only use haploid. They're really cheap and fast to grow, easy to manipulate. Um, they have about 6,000 genes, their genome is completely annotated and sequenced, and about 50% of human genes have a homolog in yeast, and that's the key here. So we asked again, why yeast? We know they're a great system, but why does it work for us? Well, in humans, there are several set domain containing proteins that methylate lysine 4 of histone H3. So there's, in fact, there's almost six of these proteins in, ye in humans. But in yeast, there is only one. So yeast has greatly simplified this system. So what this table is showing you here is I'm showing you the yeast set 1 gene, if you just look at the top, the yeast set 1 gene is the only set 1 methyl transferase in yeast that allows for histone H3 lysine 4 methylation, while humans have 1, 2, 3, 4, and actually 2 others, actually have 6 different proteins that all methylate histone H3 and lysine 4. Now, they methylate different genes in different regions of the genome and they're active in different cell types, but in general, having six versions of the same gene or protein that methylate the same substrate makes study of this very difficult. So that's why we've chosen to use yeast to study the, the function of MLL and the function of SET1 because it's greatly simplified in yeast. 
And if you look across here, what's in blue and yellow are the accessory proteins. So these are the other proteins that work with the enzyme at the top here. So BRE2, SPP1, SWD1, et cetera, are all accessory proteins that work with that one. AS2L, RB, BP5, WDR5, et cetera, are proteins that work with MLL, and they happen to have homologs between yeast and humans. So BRE2 is a homolog to AS2L, SWD1 to RB, SWD3 to WDR5. So we have this nice system where there are similarities between these protein complexes. So in yeast, this is a schematic here of what we think the complex looks like in yeast. And in yeast, we call the entire methyltransferase complex, so the enzyme and its accessory proteins, the compass complex, which I've been given several years ago. So the SEM1 enzyme is in orange here, and it kind of acts as a scaffold, <coughs> we think, to the other accessory proteins. So it's not known is how all these accessory proteins are required for this enzyme to methylate histones. There's a lot of unknowns here. How are these proteins involved are required for this methylation? And that's a lot of what, why we're interested in studying this. So why are we doing this? So there is a medical application. So chromosomal translocations that I talked about with MLL can lead to leukemias. Thus, MLL becomes a poor drug target. So it's not just that chromosomal translocations are occurring with this MLL1 gene. It's that there are over 78 different chromosomal tar genes that are fusing to MLL. So what that means in a patient with MLL is that their M patient with leukemia, who has MLL leukemia, their MLL1 gene translocation doesn't always look like someone else's MLL1 gene translocation. There's another protein stuck onto MLL1. So that actually makes the MLL1 enzyme itself a very poor drug target because it's different from patient to patient. So it's hard to design a drug to a protein that doesn't always look the same. But since MLL1 is known to require at least two to three accessory proteins for its activity, okay, then this means that these accessory proteins could serve as a potential drug target. Because if these accessory proteins are required for the function of the enzyme, maybe blocking them could serve as a potential drug target. So what we want to do is elucidate the mechanism of regulation between these accessory proteins and the MLL to potentially identify a new drug target. So our first aim is to construct the human MLL1 complex in yeast. So essentially what we want to do is humanize the yeast. So we want to take our yeast and get rid of the existing SET1 complex, the existing enzyme complex, and replace it with the human complex. So we've made a human model in our yeast. And our second aim is to investigate the interactions between these protein members. So do the proteins in compass potentially interact with those in the human complex? So we want to make these hybrid protein complexes, which I'll get to in a minute. So the first step was to essentially develop our yeast model. So what we want to be able to do is make this yeast strain here. So I kind of draw my yeast as little circles with little buds on them, because yeast divide by budding. So my little white yeast down here has, in this case, four genes deleted in this picture. So wherever you see a delta, that means the gene has been deleted. So when we say delete genes or remove genes from yeast, we're not actually going in and cutting them out of the genome. What we're actually doing is <coughs> taking the individual yeast genes and replacing them with an antibiotic resistance cassette. So similar like you think of in uh, microbiology class, different antibiotic resistance cassettes. So in yeast, we can replace genes with different antibiotic resistance cassettes, which functionally deletes the gene. So the gene is no longer there, it's been replaced. So our idea, our plan, was to do this with the four different yeast genes, so the SET1 enzyme and three accessory proteins, and then, so this is, would be the schematic yeast right here, so it's deficient in these four members of this yeast complex, and then put back into the yeast the members of the human complex. So add back in MLL1, H2L, RB, and WDR5 on expression plasmids, which you can do in yeast. You can put in plasmids containing genes and then induce expression of these genes to proteins in yeast. So this was our original idea. 
um, schematically how this is done. Very simple. If you have your favorite gene, so I like using these YFGs and YFPs. So your favorite gene in the genome, if you want to get rid of it in yeast, you use, you essentially delete the gene, replace it with an antibiotic resistance cassette, and then you would never get your favorite protein made because your favorite gene was gone. So we would do this process for each of the human, I mean the yeast genes. The way this is done at the molecular level is through a gene knockout technology, which is actually rather simple. So yeast love to undergo homologous recombination. So if you give yeast a piece of DNA that looks like something in their genome, they will undergo homologous recombination very quickly, very readily. So we introduce these antibiotic resistance cassettes with targeting primers on either end, and the yeast do the work for us. They undergo homologous recombination and take our antibiotic resistance cassette and put it in place of our favorite gene, and then we can select for these genes by plating our yeast on antibiotic-containing media. So it's a pretty simple process that actually only takes about a week to do. Um, and the undergrads really enjoy doing it. It's pretty straightforward. So after we went through a lot of these experiments, I'm going to first show you some of the single deletion strains we've done and then move on to the um, more complicated models. So the way these experiments work is that we take our yeast, and the strain of yeast that we started using was W303. It's just the name of the wild-type yeast lab strain that we have. And we took these yeast and we deleted the SAT1 gene from them. When you delete the SAT1 gene from yeast, you lose its methyl transferase activity. So if you were to take these yeast and extract all their proteins, run them on an SDS page gel, and do a Western blot on them for your specific antibody, the antibodies that we're using are antibodies that are detecting methylation of histones. We're detecting the methyl transferase activity by assessing the levels of methylation on the histones in these yeast. So if you get rid of the SET1 gene in yeast, you lose methylation, so there's no band there. When you were put back in the SET1 gene, you restore methylation. And when we put back in the human gene in this case, we've not restored methylation. So we've done this for these four different yeast genes, SAT1, V2, SWD1, and SWD3. And what we were able to show is that we could only restore complete methyl transferase function in a few of them. We could restore it when we put back in the human homolog of this V2 accessory protein, and when we put in this human homolog of this SWD1 protein. So this wasn't too surprising. Yeast, for example, <coughs> are lacking that one, these yeasts lack the enzyme that allows for methylation. So when we, if we just stick back in the human gene, the human gene apparently can't function on its own. Maybe it needs the context of other human genes for it to function properly, and that was our idea. So just a background, we did notice no growth difference in any of our yeast strains. This is kind of something you have to do in yeast. Um, you do dilution plating, so we see no growth differences between any of our strains, which was important. Um, and then my students set out to do what we're calling multi-gene replacement strains. So this is where we're going through and trying to make a yeast strain that's deficient in three to four different yeast genes. And they do, they can actually determine if they've done this by doing PCR genotyping of the yeast. So what they've been able to do, we actually have gotten single deletions and double deletions with SET1, so SET1 and different accessory proteins, and all of those strains appear to be viable and we can grow them, everything is great. Then they went through and made three different triple deletion strains <coughs> in various combinations and all of these yeast strains were viable. So we were very happy. But then we hit a problem. And we tried to create what we considered a quadruple deletion strain. We deleted four genes. We wanted to delete the methyltransferase enzyme and three accessory proteins. And as soon as we tried to do this, we were unsuccessful for over a couple years now. We've not been able to get this quadruple deletion strain. We have no idea what's going on. We've actually now worked with a different background strain and we still can't figure it out. So we were kind of, as of last summer, pretty upset about this. However, we kind of got a lucky break. And in February of this year, a paper came out in Nature. And what they actually did is they determined what the minimal components were for MLL1 function in vitro. So all of the studies to date that look at protein complex structure in yeast and humans, in MLL and SAT1, 
are done in vitro. So these are in the test tube. All the studies that we're trying to do are in vivo. And the reason we do our studies in vivo is because evidence in the literature and evidence I got as a postdoc shows that these proteins in the yeast compass and human MLL are themselves post-translationally modified. And you don't get those post-translational modifications in proteins purified and used in a test tube. You only get those in an actual model system like yeast or humans. So with that said, this paper was an in vitro study. Um, they did structural studies, and what they showed is that MLL1 only requires two accessory proteins for full function. So you can get H3K4 methylation with just MLL and two other components, RB and H2L in this case, and they saw all these structures and did all this fancy stuff. Um, and they actually figured out who binds to who. So what this showed us or gave us the idea was is that maybe we don't need this quadruple deletion strain. Maybe we only need three components to restore and to make our humanized model. So we want to know, does this occur in vivo? Do the three components, MLL, RBVP5, and H2L, do they function in an in vivo model, just the three of them? Can they mess with <coughs> histones? And can we model this? in our yeast using just three components. So fortunately, we had all these triple deletion strains. So in this experiment, I'm showing again, these are the six, I'll just be showing Western blots today. So our wild type yeast strain showed K4 methylation. When we delete set one and region, this is a double deletion, we lose methylation. And then these two lanes here are actually there's nothing there because there's no trimethylation when we have a triple deletion strain. So we've gotten rid of SAT1, BRE2, and SWD1 in this case. But when we put back in SAT1, BRE2, and SWD1, so this lane here we call a rescue. So we've deleted three genes and then reintroduced them and we restore methylation. And then when we delete the yeast genes and put in the three human genes, we were also able to restore methylation. So this shows that in vivo, we can get active methyltransferase activity from the human complex with just three components. So this was a really big deal in our lab. We were very excited. Finally, this was all working. Then we had to go back and do a few more experiments that we were kind of curious about. And this was when I actually did, I think I did this a month ago. Um, so we took a triple deletion strain that we've been looking at, and we wanted to find out in yeast what was the minimal number of components we could use to restore methylation. So I took the triple deletion strain, and I added back in just set one, and I didn't get methylation. And then I added in two components, S set one and B2, and I didn't get methylation. And I added in another two, and I didn't get, and I had to actually put in all three yeast components in order to restore methylation. So it appears that yeast, like humans, only require these three components for full methylation. Um, we've gone a little further. This was showing um, a different yeast strain we were using. So we've been using this W303 background strain. Another background strain is called BY4741. And all this is showing is that we could repeat our results in this strain, which we were very happy about. So, we have these yeast strains where we have some yeast proteins and some human proteins. So because of this model, we can actually look at where yeast proteins could interact with human proteins. So for like a biomedical standpoint, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You're never going to have a situation where you have yeast proteins and human proteins interacting with one another. But understanding if those interactions can and cannot take place teaches us about the function of these proteins. And that's what we're interested in because we want to know if a protein like H2L, RB, DP5, or WPR5 would be a good drug target. So we first wanted to look at <coughs> if SET1, which normally binds to breed 2 could bind to a human protein, H2L. And one of my students a couple summers ago was doing yeast 2 hybrid assays, which is kind of an in vitro type model, even though it is done in yeast. She was able to show that human SET1 and H2L probably are inter interacting with one another. But we really wanted to know more than if these two proteins were just interacting with one another. We wanted to know if they could form a functional complex together. So we took a double deletion strain where we just deleted the SAT1 enzyme and the yeast 3 2 enzyme. And when we add back in yeast, SAT1 and 3 2 is our rescue experiment, 
we can restore methylation. And when we add back in two human genes, MLL and AS2L, it looks like we can restore methylation. This has other implications. Um, but what we were looking at in this experiment was that if we add in SET1 and AS2L together, we can actually restore methylation. So it looks like SET1 and AS2L can bind one another and allow for methylation to occur. This is assuming that SET1 and AS2L are also binding a third component in the system, which is SWD1. So we think SET1 can bind to AS2L along with SWD1 to form a functional complex. And then we also think that MLL can bind to its normal accessory protein AS2L as well as SWD1 to form a functional complex. So we're excited about some of these hybrid studies and interested in pursuing a few more of these. So I've gone, I've talked a whole lot about this yeast compass complex and its accessory proteins. Um, I'm going to go through a few ongoing and future studies and then tell you a little about another project in our lab. So what we're doing now is we're assessing other yeast human, yeast human hybrid complexes in our triple deletion strain, like I mentioned, trying to figure out what other proteins can interact with one another. Um, we're doing co-immunoprecipitation experiments with these hybrid complexes to see if there's an actual binding, which we think there is because we're seeing function. Um, and we know that these proteins complexes are functional because there's binding. We also have another strain in our lab where we have the SET1 enzyme rendered catalytically inactive. So the enzyme or protein itself is still made, it's just not functional. And we're trying to actually use this strain to create a pseudo quadruple deletion. So I have a student working on this right now. We're actually now trying to work with the quadruple deletion strain in our new yeast background and have actually been unsuccessful as we kind of predicted. And we're also working with another human protein called DPY30 that's been implicated um, as a component in MLL function in some other papers. So I'm going to switch to something a little different, which, I thought, which I've not talked about in a seminar before. So, and I kind of like this story. So one of my research students who had been working on this MLL project um, is actually in grad school now. And he decided to stay back in my lab this summer after his senior year because he wanted to do his own research project. And we happened to have in the freezer for about four years a bunch of yeast strains that I'd gotten from a collaborator in New Zealand. And what these yeast strains were was these were yeast strains that were found on grapes in the vineyards in New Zealand. So that they're like, they're just in winemaking. So this guy, he's actually pretty famous, his name is Ick in New Zealand, I guess, named Matthew Goddard. Um, a friend of mine knew him, and we asked him to send us a bunch of yeast strains. So these are non-saccharomyces yeast that are grown in the wild. Okay, so he sent us these yeast strains like four years ago and I shoved them in the freezer and forgot about it. So I had this student and he wanted to do his own research project. And I said, well, you hear these yeast strains, do whatever you want. So he pioneered this project and he started going through the freezer and he was able to get <coughs> two of these strains. I'm going to call them initials because they cannot pronounce them. I'm going to call them RG and HU. So these are wild yeast strains grown in vineyards. And my student, Emery, so what he wanted to do <coughs> is he knew that in the vineyard there are many different kinds of yeast present on the grapes, okay? But when you take these grapes and use them for winemaking purposes, these natural yeast that are on the grapes get competed away by Saccharomyces yeast that are used for the fermentation, okay? But it's thought that these different yeasts that are on the existing grapes contribute to the flavor of the wine. So winemakers are very concerned or interested in the types of yeast, natural wild yeast that are occurring on their grapes. So my student Emery is very interested in ecology, which is strange that he was in my lab. Um, so he, wanted, he said that a selective pressure has the potential to affect the composition of these yeast on grapes. And that selective pressure is UV light from the sun. Okay, and the UV light, UV radiation in New Zealand is much higher than it is here. Okay? So he was curious if UV light affected these yeast in different ways. So what we did is, he, these are some of his yeast. One of, some of them were bright pink. We had another strain that was bright orange. 
So the question he asked was, how does UV light affect the growth of these vineyard yeast strains? Okay? So we thought this was going to be the easiest project in the world. We thought we were going to grow these yeast and stick them under um, a germicidal lamp, because most labs have germicidal lamps in them, or lamps that you use to like irrit um, cause DNA damage. So we thought this was going to be the easiest project. He was going to take these yeast strains and shove them under the UV light. Well, he quickly learned that was not the case. So apparently, germicidal UV lamps that we have in our labs, the amount of UV light that they're emitting is, ex is very, shouldn't say it's not, it's very hard to know the amount of, and intensity of UV light emitting from a lamp that you happen to have in your lab without a UV meter. So we had a lot of trouble trying to figure out what UV light source to use. And the UV lamp that we had in our lab apparently was emitting UVC and UVB. Um, and we wanted to be able to control for UVA, UVB, and UVC and determine, make a more natural environment or more natural what you get in the environment. Control for ozone, all sorts of things. <clears throat> so we read about a few things. This is kind of what we had in our lab, which is a germicidal lamp kind of set up. Another thing you can use is a strata linker. I use these as a grad student. It looks like a microwave. You just shove whatever you want into the microwave, push a button, and it zaps it with UVC light. Um, but this would actually kill our yeast in like two seconds, so we couldn't use that. So we actually walked up to the chemistry department, which we don't always do as biologists, and we started rummaging around their labs and seeing what they had. And one of the labs had this really cool machine called a rayonet. And these were developed not for the purpose we wanted. Has anyone heard of a rayonet? Yes, I had never heard of this thing. You can actually buy them on eBay, um, which we almost did. So what a rayonet is, is this really cool machine where you can, and this is kind of looking down the, down the top of it, and it's made with all these different light bulbs in it. And what you can buy from this company are light bulbs in any wavelength you want. You can have UVC, you can have UVB, you can have UVA, you can have whatever you want. And they are kind enough to tell you the intensity emitted from every single lamp. And you can, for example, just put in two lamps or one lamp, or three lamps, or four lamps. You have complete control over the environment in this chamber. And these are actually used for like polymerization in chemistry labs. So my student Emery went through a lot of work and figured out that he could stick his yeast plate way in the bottom of this barrel. And we actually used a picture frame holder to prop up the yeast, the plate, and irradiate his yeast. And what he was able to determine was, let's just go down here first. This is with a germicidal lamp. So just a regular lamp in a lab. And what happened is we couldn't control the flux um, or intensity of this lamp. So as soon as we stuck most of our yeast in, even for very short dosages, our yeast died immediately. We, didn't, we couldn't really get good data with it. So that prompted us to use the rayonet. So what Emery had shown is that certain yeast strains, so the RG strain in our case, actually is much more tolerant of UVC and UVB light as opposed to regular lab strains like BY40, BY47, 41, or the other wild vineyard yeast strain, HU, that we looked at. So we actually saw differences between these different strains in their exposure to UV light, which he was really excited about. We did one more molecular experiment where we showed we could treat these different yeasts with different doses of UV light and actually look at histone phosphorylation, or H2A gamma X, to show, us, which is a sign of UV damage in yeast. We were actually doing this at the molecular level. So I present this to show you that this was an undergrad who took the initiative, initiative to develop his own project, and we're submitting this to actually a viticulture journal, which is a journal on winemaking, um, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so the student responsible <coughs> for all the yeast wine work is Emery. He's now a graduate student at Wash U in his first year. The students responsible for all of the MLL and SET1 work are David Klein and Marion Baker. And this is my lab from the last three summers. I have a lot of returning students. Um, so I'd like to thank all the students in my lab, Sharon Dent's lab at MD Anderson for help with some of the initial strain construction some past lab members, and then in gray for the funding for everything. And I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you.
Well, he was trying, there was one that was red, and he was curious about the anthocyanins in it. So I don't know, but yeah. He was thinking that the anthocyanins would maybe, are giving it a protective effect. And maybe that's why one of the strains was surviving longer than others. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, so I was curious about the bus trunk with the ML L1 dash. Mm -hmm. um, looks like when you're looking at the histone, you had that that lane had a lot more methylation. Do you have ideas why that is? You're exactly right. So wild type yeast have much higher levels of methylation naturally than we're <coughs> putting in our human components. And we really think that we're either not putting in enough of the protein because I know that the wild type or natural levels in yeast are actually pretty high. You can actually purify the complexes out and see them on a colloidal stain gel. So I wonder if we're not putting in enough, for example. Um, but that's a really good question. And we, we kind of expected to not see as high levels. I really don't know why. We just kind of had that um, idea all along. So we, really, we think it really is a protein level issue. That's okay. a good question. So when you're deleting the segments in the yeast genome and you're replacing them with antibiotic mm -hmm. sets, so then when you add in the human genes, where are you putting them? Are you putting them in place of the cassettes that's and a, removing those? That's a or? good question. We're actually we're expressing them on plasmids. Okay. So they're actually under inducible promoters. So in this case, they're under a galactose promoter. So we actually control their expression. So we put in the plasmids. We grow up the yeast and then we give them galactose as a sugar source and it induces the expression of those genes. So it is an artificial system. So we're forcing their expression, which is we could put them into the genome. We've kind of avoided doing that. But yeah. For your study looking at yeast and, and how they tolerate uh, different intensities or different types of UV light, <coughs> do your results? match up with the uh, types of UV uh, found in New Zealand? So we've looked, we've actually been looking at a lot of papers on UV light lately. So the one thing we, he actually did it a couple of times. So you, New Zealand obviously has higher intensity UV light coming. Um, but the, we've, you can actually simulate the ozone layer because the ozone is blocking so much of UVC, otherwise it would all be burned or whatever. Um, you can actually simulate the ozone with an acetate um, film. We actually put it over the yeast. And he didn't see as, it was not that significant that he was blocking that much radiation with it. So we really don't know how much this is actually um, mimicking the actual natural environment. We're doing the best we can. Um, but yeah, we've thought about just walking outside and just sticking him on the sidewalk, <laughs> which I kind of joked about doing one day, because we have a UV meter in the lab. So we can actually measure UVB and UVA outside. Um, but that was one idea. <laughs> Has he tried to collect any other yeast from local vineyards? Well, so we, we have, a, have a colleague who knows quite a bit about um, winemaking, and I was like, well, let me just go get some grapes or something. I said it during the summer, and she's like, oh, there's none on the vine right now or something. But um, that lab in New Zealand sent us like 15 yeast strains, but they sent them from New Zealand and we could only get two to actually grow in our lab, and we really don't know why. Um, so we're hoping they'll send us more. The antibody that you used as a UV uh, stress marker, mm -hmm. did that, was that a histone? Did that That's react? actually a histone antibody, if that's a known antibody. So histones become, phos histone H2A becomes phosphorylated in response to DNA damage. So that's showing us that we are inducing a DNA damage response, and that's what's likely killing the yeast. Kind of as an, an internal control. We hope the idea in publishing his study, even though it's kind of small, is so others could use this to study their own yeast strains. Was was our idea? So bringing it back to the drug targets, um, are these proteins found in any other? place in the genome that you would be targeting that bind to MLL that you said might be a better target for drugs? Which so, are they located anywhere else? So the MLL gene, so it's undergoing translocations with other with over 78 different protein partners. So they're being translocated onto the MLL locus. 
So the drug targets that we're thinking of are proteins like H2L and RBBP5, because we think if they are required for activation, if they could impede their activity. Um, that's what we're thinking. So they're located on a different chromosome than MLL. Great, but are those solely related to MLL, or are they there? So H2L has been implicated in a few other things, um, I think with stem cell development, I think, I could be wrong, um, but the others do not have a whole lot of other functions. But H2L, actually mutations in H2L alone have been linked to different types of cancers. That's actually the only one that's actually pretty well studied. That's a good question. So if one of the targets of MLL is the oxygen, yeast don't have oxygen. Nope. What is set one controlling? Do we know? We don't know. So there's our studies out there, but it's a lot of housekeeping genes. Yeah, we have not gone and done RT-PCR either. People have, though. We just haven't. OK, so also on the Hox gene, so if it's born with a fusion MLL protein, um, does it affect their neuron? So most cases of these MLL fusions, it's a heterozygous situation. So they have a functional copy and a non-functional copy. So I think at birth there is no phenotype. Um, it's just that I think either the other something else. There has to be another mutation causing this. But there it is. They're mostly heterozygous. So if it's homozygous or acquired a second mutation, is lethal? I think so. I think so. Thank you. Thank you.